All right, so cloud computing is clearly experiencing um, pretty sustained and rapid growth over the last number of years and certainly projected to do so for the coming future. Um, I think it's important for us to distinguish several cloud computing models and I'll actually talk about a couple of these today and give you guys a little bit of a flavor of what it's like to operate um, cancer genomics or run cancer genomics analyses in, in two types of cloud. So we typically talk about sort of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service type of, of cloud offerings where for the most part, people tend to use the infrastructure as a service where basically a cloud operator provides hardware to you and a virtualization layer, and you're responsible for basically creating your own virtual machines, setting up networking and so on and so forth, putting your own applications on it. In a platform as a service type of offering, um, the cloud provider actually may provide a set of different services on top of the virtualized hardware, so things like databases or queues and, and, and a bunch of different uh, pieces of, of software that you can use in building your applications. And then in, in software as a service, you basically get an application that might as well not be running on the cloud for as far as you're concerned. Um, so I will focus, um, my talk today has two parts. One, one talks about our experience building systems and deploying large scale analysis on the infrastructure as a service type of cloud. So sort of your OpenStack environments that you already have experience with, with, with running or also Amazon Web Services and, and so on and so forth. And also an example of sort of a high, somewhere in between the platform and, and software as a service um, cloud where um, several companies like Seven Bridges Genomics or DNA Nexus have basically built platforms and allow you to get access to data and, and run your analyses on them. So I guess this may be a little bit of sort of preaching to the choir, but I think it's still worth articulating some of these points. Um, so in as far as bioinformatics adoption of cloud computing services goes, there's also a lot of growth in this field. I think it's driven by, by sort of several, several different parameters. One of them is, is increased data set size. So we have projects going, you know, running the gamut from something like a thousand genomes project weighing in at about 200 terabytes in size, uh, projects like pan cancer analysis of whole genomes, 750 terabytes. The whole of ICGC, the International Cancer Genomics Consortium, is over a petabyte. And now there are projects coming online, like the Human Cell Atlas that we're talking about, weighing in at about 50 petabytes. Um, and so dealing with that size of a data set obviously requires quite a lot of computing power. And so clouds offer us the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, the other driving factor is actually the wider availability of cloud computing environments. So certainly. Um, environments like AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Compute Platform, these environments are available globally and so it doesn't really matter where you're operating your research group from, you can, you can deploy to one of those environments and, and sort of enjoy the benefits. We have other academic clouds, so the EBI Embassy Cloud, I think you guys have already heard from Dario or if you haven't you will shortly. Um, there's also the Open Science Data Cloud in the US that offers similar Similar functionality, there's of course the, the Denby network, so there's a, a, a group of clouds being built in Germany that will be operated by Denby. Um, there's the European Open Science Cloud, a, a pan-European or a, a European initiative, and then environments like I talked about, Seven Bridges, DNA Nexus, and so on. And then sort of the last, the last factor in, in the growing adoption of cloud computing technologies is actually the desire of researchers to both share best practices and also establish some standards. And so in this regard, we can, we can talk about Docker and I think you guys have heard probably enough over the course of this week. You know, I'll, I'll touch briefly on, on our use of Docker, but we won't really get into the details. I don't like the look of that. Okay, and then we also have uh, the standards body, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, so this, this is actually a, uh, an international group that has come together to try to sort of build up the next set of bioinformatics standards and genomic standards that already have built into them this assumption that we're not necessarily open, uh, um, we're not necessarily operating in an institution local environment, but we're operating on the cloud computing environment and we're building large scale systems 
We're processing petabytes of data. So what does that mean for the types of applications and the types of architectures that we're going to be deploying? Um, so what is actually driving some of the some of the some of the increases around the data set size? Well, first of all, we're we're trying to integrate different data sets. So while a lot of the studies before we, we talked about only doing um, DNA sequencing or RNA seq or proteomics and so on, there's more and more studies that are basically integrating and using now multi-dimensional data set to look sort of at at the same problem, whether it be cancer or other disease and so on. Um, the other aspect of data set growth is trying to get increased cohort sizes. So to me, I, I really like this slide. Um, basically, this figure shows you the sample. It, it's sort of a power analysis, basically. And this figure shows you it, it runs through different cancer types. And, and most of my examples will be from the cancer genomics field. But it runs through different cancer types, which have differing mutation rates, somatic mutation rates. And it tells you what is the cohort size that you need to have for a particular cancer type to have 90% power to detect mutations that occur at a particular frequency band. And so as an example, when we're looking at something like melanoma, which has a pretty high somatic mutation frequency rate, if we want to have 90% power to detect genes mutated in greater than 2% of the cases, we need 5,300 samples. So if we're talking about doing whole genome sequencing, this is already double what the, the Pan Cancer Project has done, which it's, you know, it's taken people a good four years to get to where they are, and we're only now in the process of writing papers. And so there's definitely the appetite because we want to understand, we want to inter interrogate those genes, and so we'll be creating bigger and bigger data sets to go after that. So cloud computing skills are increasingly important for bioinformaticians. These are kind of what I think of, of the reasons. So we talked about data set size. We can't download data sets locally for the most part, at least the raw data. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of free compute capacity that is available now. You know, people are building different cloud computing environments. There is a lot of research credits that are going around. And so if you have an appetite for analyzing these data sets, you can really go after a lot of free computing. So I think it's important to be able to take advantage of that. Um, at least, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of resources. There are some data sets that are becoming uniquely available on the cloud. Um, you know, as we discover with genomic data sets, different countries have different rules about how, what data can go on the cloud or what data can go on different computing environments. And so you actually end up having sort of this, um, this network of computing systems where you can only access, for instance, the German data on a German side, the US data on, on a US cloud. And so basically, certain clouds give you an opportunity to access unique data sets that you couldn't actually access in any other way. Um, you, of course, want to be able to use the most recent tools. You want to have maximum impact for your own work. So when you've built your system, you want it to be usable by other people, so you, you, know, you end up putting it on GitHub or you end up putting a Docker image and, and, and you want to be able to basically share it with other people. Okay, well, so what shape does, do these skills actually take? What is it that you need to know? What are the new skills? So I think there's definitely platform-specific domain knowledge that is required, so every cloud's sort of a bit of a snowflake in, 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 in sort of the unique ways that it offers capacity or services, so you have you know, your gamut of different cloud computing environments, AWS, Azure, OpenStack, and so on and so forth. They're quite similar, but of course they have their own APIs and the little tricks. Uh, there's a whole DevOps toolkit that you need to be able to pick up because of course when you operate, especially on these infrastructure as a service type clouds, it's really up to you to manage all of it. You know, the types of things that you might have expected your IT team at your institution to manage in the past, it's really up to you to do that. So this concerns Linux administration, networking, security, monitoring, testing automation, deployment, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, you need scripting skills, um, Python, JavaScript, or whatever it happens to be your favorite language, although I have to sort of advocate for Python in this regard. When I, when I look at the different APIs that are available for scripting and interacting with cloud computing platforms, this is the one that, that I see the, the most. Um, there's a containerization aspect. I won't dwell too much on it. Um, there's this notion of service orientation. So a lot of bioinformatics tools have been built over the years with, with sort of the model of we have a tool that 
you need to deploy and run on data, but, but the tool exists mostly as code. The, the concept of service orientation really talks about the fact that your tool is actually a service that provides something to a client. And so in this model, when, when you build something, you're not just building code that somebody needs to download and understand how to run, you're actually providing a service to a client. And so this has wide ranging impacts on both the architecture of the tools and also the types of uh, things that you pay attention to and think are important when you build your next bioinformatics tool. There's a number of workflow frameworks that exist out there. I mean, in the end, in bioinformatics, we want to run our tools on data. So we need workflows, we need sequences of steps, and, and we need to be able to run those reliably. Uh, I list a few here. Um, so Toil, and, and these are modern ones that, that have been built recently by far, you know, by far not an exhaustive list, of course. Uh, Toils is a, Toil is a very recent tool that has been developed at uh, UCSC. Santa Cruz based on Python, support for common workflow language, support for AWS, but also some very basic support for deploying on other environments. Uh, we have Next, Nextflow, Nextflow developed at the CRG using Groovy. Uh, they actually have developed a domain specific language that you use for uh, describing your workflows. There's some support for AWS and, and also support for some HPC environments. Butler is a framework that we actually authored in our group, so I'll talk the most about that, of course. Um, this has been developed at the EMBL based on Python. Um, I'll go into the details, but, but the key sort of highlights is the fact that there's full support for many different clouds, which I think is extremely important when you want to run your analysis, because I think sort of as a modern bioinformatician, you need to be both nimble and opportunistic about where you deploy to. So I think it's not really enough for you to be able to say, well, we just run on Amazon or we run an OpenStack and so on and so forth because tomorrow you might be doing analysis on another cloud. And so gives it, this gives it a lot of power. And it also has comprehensive monitoring and configuration management. And I'll go into our experience with using Butler on, on large scale projects. And, and to me, this is one of the important components. You know, I talked about service orientation and operational focus, and this is one of the dimensions of that, basically. So you're not just running a tool, you're actually running a long running analysis. Many things may go wrong and you need the tools to be able to tell what's going on and fix it. And there's also some rudimentary support for, for uh, CWL. So what has actually been the genesis of Butler? So Butler has been created in the context of this pan cancer analysis of whole genomes project. I think many people will have heard of it. Um, or, or know quite a lot about it, but in general, this is a large-scale uh, international initiative to analyze um, whole genome samples from 2,834 cancer patients across several different cancer types using a combination of cloud computing as well as high-performance computing from a number of different institutions and at a number of different cloud computing environments. Total data set size is about 750 gigabytes of data or terabytes of data, about 725 raw uh, DNA sequence data, and then and another uh, variant calls and so on and so forth. So this is kind of basically uh, um, distribution of the different computing sites and, and what different technologies are used. This is not comprehensive. Sites have come and gone. I think by some measures, there's been 13 different sites and nine of them have used cloud computing environments, AWS and, and, and Microsoft Azure and so on and so forth. But in general, the mix has been probably two thirds cloud computing environment and one third HPC. Uh, we're, we're looking at having run about 16,000 cores, 60 terabytes of RAM and, and so on. This slide here shows you a timeline of progress for the different computational pipelines that have been used to actually accomplish the, the, the analysis. And without going too much into the details, uh, well, we're looking at a runtime of about two years to have run these pipelines. Um, so each one represents basically how long it's taken us to get to the, to the through the full cohort and, and different analysis. So BWA is kind of the, the genome alignment pipeline followed by three different somatic variant calling pipelines and, all, and then also a, a filtering pipeline. The key thing to take away from the slide is uh, if you look at sort of the general trajectory of progress, you see that, well, just about everybody tends to make pretty swift progress through the first half of the data set and then goes on for the next year to get to 100%. And so this is a general trend that we have seen. So to me, you know, there, 
good reasons for every squiggly on this chart, but, but I think the main story is the fact that these lines represent the happy path, and everything that happens after is, well, what crashed, or data problems, et cetera, et cetera. And so our ability to deal with that last sort of 50% of the data is really what determines whether your project is going to take six months or two years. So that's, I think, an important sort of opportunity for us to go after. Go for it. Yeah, so well, sometimes uh, samples were taken away because there was data issues discovered and so they come offline and then those issues are, so rather than sort of just brushing over that, we, you know, we actually plot it, but yeah, that's thanks. Okay, so, well, what were some of the lessons learned? I mean, this will read a little bit like kind of doomsday, but, but in the end, we saw a lot of infrastructure failures. We saw a lot more of this, especially on academic clouds and OpenStack-based environments than we have seen on environments like Azure or AWS. Disks fail, there's network events that bring everything down with them, and so on. We see a lot of failures of bioinformatics tools. Of course, you guys all know, these are fairly experimental tools, so, well, issues happen. Defects, bad data, so on. So the key lesson was, well, you're actually on your own to solve all these problems, so you must be self-reliant in diagnosing and resolution issues. You need the tools to be able to do that. The manual resolution and investigation of failures has been a major contributor based on sort of what I've shown you before. So in trying to deal with some of this, we've sort of I thought about the problem as, as, as having four broad categories of needs for a bioinformatician or a researcher who wants to be able to operate at these scales and in these environments. So we think about one being provisioning, provisioning meaning that you want to be able to create clusters of virtual machines on different cloud computing environments and, and, and sort of have basic setup capabilities to be able to do that. Configuration management, i.e. installing and configuring software on, on these virtual machines. Workflow, of course, so you want to run tools and, and, and um, define dependencies and so on. And then operations management, what does it mean to actually run these for a long time, get to 100% of the data, and, and, and sort of do so effectively. So to help deal with those, we have developed this Butler framework. Uh, it's available on GitHub for you guys to check out uh, if you want to run it. Um, one of the sort of key um, design principles behind creating it was to use as much open, so open source software components as are available. And so it relies a lot on different open source projects that are quite active. Typically, they have hundreds of contributors each. And so I think it's, it's sort of a, a, a pretty robust way to develop software, especially in an academic environment where I think building things from scratch uh, poses challenges after you've delivered it. So we're doing provisioning using a tool called Terraform. Um, so this is basically a tool that allows you to define with sort of um, uh, one format configuration templates for deploying virtual machines on different cloud computing environments. I mean, I'm showing five here, but the list is more like 30. But it definitely covers all the major ones and then some more esoteric ones. This allows us to create and tear down clusters, to define network topology, define basic security, template things, allows us to create our infrastructure as code. I mean, other people have mentioned this, and I'm also, of course, a big believer in this paradigm. Uh, configuration management is accomplished with Salt Stack. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have already had the, the talk about Ansible. This is very similar to Ansible. Uh, basically allows you to create recipes for software configurations. It has uh, a management node that oversees the configuration state basically of all of the virtual machines in your cluster. And you're basically using uh, a declarative configuration language to say what are the different pieces of software that need to be on different machines and what state they need to be on, versions, dependency resolution, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's sort of based on this paradigm of being able to define what the different states are that infrastructure should be in, um, having a, a set of virtual machines that can be given different roles, and then having a mapping between the roles that you give and the different states that exist in something that's called a top file. And so the sort of the overseer machine will, will, will look at the role mappings and then will bring the infrastructure into the state that you've specified that it should be in. 
we use a component called Apache Airflow. So this is an uh, Apache incubation project, uh, but this is, this is a framework that has been developed at Airbnb and used in quite some large scale projects. Um, so this is a, a distributed workflow system. Uh, it lets you create workflows as directed as cyclic graphs. Uh, each workflow is a Python program, so you basically get kind of the full capabilities of Python to be able to define the types of things that you can do, which I think is very powerful. So it can be both simple, you know, you basically just define dependencies between tasks, but you can also use any of the Python libraries and so on. Um, a key sort of assumption that is made in Airflow is that each workflow task within this graph is an individually packaged and run Python program, and so this allows us to achieve pretty good scalability by basically releasing the assumption that different workflow steps will run on the same machine. And so I'll show you a little bit more under the hood of how, of how it works, but because you've released those assumptions, you can basically randomly assign tasks to machines, and so when machines drop out, you, you basically don't end up having jobs that are stuck, you don't end up having to meet those requirements. Uh, and there are many integrations with Airflow, with different modern data stores, compute engines, using things like Spark, Hive, and so on. Um, so this is actually a diagram of the workflow execution engine. Uh, it runs um, a virtual machine that is responsible for hosting the workflow engine and scheduler. The scheduler will look at the different workflows that you have defined and sort of set off. It will, it will figure out which tasks are runnable at any given point in time, and it will stick those tasks into a distributed queue using RabbitMQ at this point. And then the workflow component, the, the, the worker components is basically a fleet of virtual machines, and each one of them will dial into this queue periodically and say, okay, I'm free, I can take the next task, grab the task from the queue, and then very sporadically communicate with the workflow engine to basically say, yeah, I'm still up, I'm still doing my thing. And so you have this loose coupling between components. Uh, you, can, uh, you can scale up um, horizontally the workflow scheduler if you end up running a lot of these, although we've run this at sort of a couple thousand cores level on a single scheduler, and then I've run sort of a fleet of um, 120 or so of these worker machines. And so you can, you can obviously bring the workers up and down quite easily. So in order to actually keep track of scientific analyses, I mean, I've run through a lot of different open source components. I mean, they're all, they're all sort of glued together, but one thing that we want to keep in mind while well, we're using these to do scientific analysis. So we've built a, a, a database model for keeping track of analyses. It's based on sort of a fairly simple set of objects. We keep track of things like workflows. We keep track of things like analyses and then analyses run. So analyses run is basically an instance of running a particular workflow in the context of a particular analysis on a sample or in a set of samples. And so this, allow, this allows us to keep track of sort of what's going on. And then one object I didn't really talk about yet is configuration because of course we have different tools, we want to configure them, we want to pass them different configuration parameters. So we've developed sort of this multi-level hierarchical configuration system where you can define configurations at three different levels that are then resolved at runtime into what's basically an effective configuration. Each one of these configurations is uh, just a JSON object, and then they basically get merged and end up stored in a PostgreSQL database that is then um, easily queryable and, and is used at execution to feed into the runtime of the different tools. When you're actually running workflows, you have a series of graphical dashboards that you can use to ascertain what is actually going on, drill into the state of different things. Um, this is sort of a basic dashboard that ships with, with Airflow. So this shows you different workflows that you have, states of the different tasks, and then you can basically, for each task, you can drill into it, look at the logs, look at you know how is the execution going, and so on and so forth. Uh, so operational management is the fourth component of Butler uh, that I'm going to talk about. So how do we gather, you know, what, what is the actually the, the basis of, of operational management? Well, we need to measure different metrics. And so metrics come from two different things. Uh, we use two different products to be able to do this. One of these is called collected. And this is basically a monitoring component that is able to harvest different health metrics from any host that you're running in your cluster. So things like CPU or RAM. Um, track your Java virtual machine, database connections, what have you. Uh, it can also, you can also send application level events to collect it. And then 
this monitoring component, uh, so, so it, it, it runs a daemon on each host, but is then able to communicate those, compo those metrics to a centralized monitoring server. And then that data is aggregated in a time series database that you then can either dig into with a query language, or you can also use a, a, a set of graphical dashboards. We also use a, a component called Logstash that is used for aggregating logs from different machines. So, I mean, literally terabytes of logs are being generated and never seen. And of course, there's a wealth of information hiding in that. And so this gives another dimension to the monitoring components. So uh, that is also running on each, on each host and is then aggregated into an elastic search index and it has its own set of uh, monitoring and querying capabilities. So this way, for however large your infrastructure is, you basically have sort of this multi-dimensional visibility into what is going on and it, it, it kind of tends to look like this. So you have these dashboards. So this shows you a typical, um, and, and this is kind of a blended load metric that, that basically tries to tell you what is the overall level of load in your compute clusters, cluster. So this shows you you're kind of starting from, from quiet and then you've scheduled a bunch of jobs. So all of the machines, we're looking at about 100 or so VMs doing, doing a computational job here. They all sort of are fully loaded and then as they start running out of data, you kind of see the tapered off. Uh, in the middle, you see um, the same monitoring dashboard showing basically an event. Um, so, you know, you can see wide spikes in load. So this will tell you, you know, as, as you're running an analysis, you basically, you can check these dashboards and it can tell you when things are going wrong. I mean, this will not necessarily result in the failure of, of, of the machines that you're running, but it can actually result in sort of garbage data being generated and, and so on. And so this gives you the signals. Um, there's also tools available now to sort of automate a lot of this and define alarms based on thresholds and so on. We haven't integrated that yet, but that's definitely on the roadmap to be that next. And then at the bottom is showing the same, uh, a similar picture, but this is now a rendering of database metrics that are harvested from logs using Logstash. That gives you a similar set of capabilities. Uh, this diagram shows sort of the overall picture of how the system deploys um, onto a cloud computing environment. This is showing our deployment on the Embassy Cloud at Embassy EBI. Uh, so the salt master component is the configuration management server. Uh, this tracker I already showed you on a separate slide. This is the workflow scheduler, the queue that is serving up the tasks. There's a fleet of workers here that are feeding metrics into the monitoring server. There is a data repository that is actually being used to access the samples under study. And so this is kind of the overall uh, deployment structure. So what have we done with this? Uh, over the course of 2015-16, we've, we've used Butler to um, analyze the pan cancer analysis of whole genomes data to, to generate uh, germline variant calls and 2,834 whole genome samples. Uh, this was genotyping of 100 million variants on each one of those samples. So um, quite a substantial compute task. We, we basically ended up going over the 750 terabyte data set and roughly um, Six times. Uh, this shows a comparison. Sort of, we we ascertain we we looked at the uniformity of progress. If if you remember the chart I showed you at the beginning about sort of the trajectory of how you make it through the analysis. So this is sort of a different rendition of the same chart, where basically sort of ideally uniform progress through a data set basically falls on the on on this line. And this shows you the analysis the analyses that I showed you a, slide, a few slides back, so we see that they deviate quite significantly, and this is sort of a, a similar rendition that shows the analysis that we uh, accomplished with Butler. And so nothing is going to be perfect, but of course, they're much more uniform and closer to sort of the ideal, ideal trajectory. We've built a series of workflows that are now available for everybody to use. So there's something that does genome alignment, and this is a, a Docker and CWL-based genome alignment pipeline. Uh, I haven't really gone into sort of the Docker CWL aspect, but Butler is able to quite easily run basically pipelines that are described with CWL and, and ship as Dockers. We have a Freebase, Germline, SNV, and Indel discovery and genotyping pipeline. Delhi, which is a tool developed at Amble for structural variant calling, both somatic and germline. Uh, there's the Sanger Cancer Genomics Project. This is a somatic variant calling pipeline that is using some tools developed at the Sanger Institute. And then some basically sort of data munging like BCF tools, VCF filter, and so on. 
well as a workflow for executing our scripts. So what are we doing with Butler this year? Um, there's some new and exciting projects that are underway. Um, so now that the pan cancer analysis project is kind of winding down, there's now a number of both offshoot projects and kind of next generation projects where, again, you want a larger cohort size. So one of the projects that we're using Butler on now is this pan prostate cancer analysis project. We're looking at uh, 1,200 high coverage whole genome samples from only prostate cancer patients and, and basically want to do uniform analysis. Um, we'll be deploying Butler on, on this uh, Denby-based network uh, of clouds that is being developed within Germany. Butler has also been uh, selected to be one of the science demonstrators for his European Open Science Cloud pilot, and, and so we're excited to be running Butler there in, in, um, in tandem, both on the EBI Embassy Cloud as well as a number of other clouds, uh, and so basically trying to operate multiple cloud computing environments together. So this kind of ties up the, the, the Butler story for you, which is, you know, really how do we deploy uh, large-scale analyses on an infrastructure-as-a-service type of cloud. So we know that clouds democratize access to large-scale computational resource, i.e. it allows institutes without uh, really large internal resources to still undertake large-scale analyses. They facilitate sharing of data and methods. Uh, I think bioinformaticians need a much wider variety of technical skills now to be able to operate effectively on cloud. I think Butler provides that functionality in sort of the four key areas that I talked to you about, provisioning, configuration, workflow, and operations. And to me, one of the sort of salient points that, that I'll continue driving, trying to drive home from Peacock is that running real analyses, real large-scale analyses, shows that operational management is really the key component in all of this. I mean, I think we can all sort of create jobs and launch them and so on and so forth, but if you're running a large fleet of virtual machines that is exercising several thousand cores, you really need the visibility into what's going on, both at very fine grain as well as coarse grain levels, be able to get through your entire cohort in time. So that's the first talk. If anybody has questions about Butler specifically, maybe it's good to take a pause for two minutes now if you have questions, but we can also discuss this later. And I will now talk afterwards about sort of uh, an another, another case study for doing analysis on the Seven Bridges Genomics Cloud. Good question. Um, so deployment's actually something we've worked quite a lot on. Um, so it's it's a it's not as simple as a pip install or something like that. I mean, this is a tool that's sort of built for doing large scale deployments, and it has a lot of moving pieces. Um, on the other hand, quite a lot of work has gone into that. So I would say that um, if you're deploying to one of the well-supported environments like OpenStack, AWS, Google Compute Platform, over the course of a day or two, you should be able to be running basically basic workflows. Uh, when you talk about porting your workflow to Butler, I think it depends what your workflow is sort of built in. So if it's, uh, if it's a Docker container or it's a CWL type workflow, you can very, very easily basically wrap that into a Butler workflow. I'm actually not a huge fan of, of sort of doing that and I have sort of a complicated uh, relationship with Docker, if you will, because I feel like on the one hand we talk about microservices and talk about building things that only do one thing, but on the other hand, we end up stuffing 10 different tools in a Docker container and then running it for a week and, and, and sort of not really benefit, benefiting, it, benefiting from the capabilities of, of the infrastructure. So you can do the wrapping, but if you actually get into how to build you know, proper workflows with Butler, you may spend a little bit more time, but I think you stand to gain uh, in the long term. Okay, so now switching hats, um, talking about now operating on a platform as a services or slash ser uh, software as a services uh, platform from Seven Bridges Genomics. Um, so how does how did this come about to be? Um, well, 
The United States has, has done a lot of work over the last couple of years about bringing genomic data that they have sequenced in, this, in the context of projects like Cancer Genome Atlas uh, into sort of the modern cloud computing age. One of the things that they've done is set up this uh, genomic data commons. So this is basically a new data repository that they've put in place that hosts all of that data. Um, there is a data portal that you can use to basically slice and dice and figure out different ways that you can download that data set. I actually highly recommend it. I think this is a very nice and, and functional data portal. Uh, sort of a parallel initiative that has gone on uh, before sort of going headfirst into cloud computing is the NCI cloud pilots. Um, this is uh, three pilot projects that have been funded by the National Cancer Institute in, uh, in the United States. Uh, their goal is to make uh, 11,000 TCGA samples accessible on the cloud uh, in order to perform large-scale analysis and do it in sort of a secure way and so on and so forth. So these have been the awards for these pilots, which have been running for a couple of years now, have gone to Seven Bridges, which has built a system based on Amazon, to the Broad Institute, which is using Google Compute Platform, and uh, Institute for Systems Biology that is also using Google. All of these environments have now gone online, and so they basically, each one of them offers you a platform as a service, a software as a service rendition of the TCGA data. And so um, these were launched in 2006 and have been uh, renewed for additional funding. So they will stick around for some time. We have chosen uh, to use uh, the Seven Bridges Genomics Cloud. This is not really an, an endorsement necessarily of this platform, but I talked earlier about sort of this opportunistic um, taking advantage of, of free compute or data sets to go after analyses that would otherwise be difficult for you to do. So what are the goals of our study? Well, we perform analysis of pen cancer uh, data and we identified a list of genes that were interesting to us where we found loss of function mutations that increase cancer risk within genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, GCKR, and so on and so forth. We're now seeking a validation cohort. Well, what we'd like to do is use 13,000 whole exome sequences that are available from TCGA, which is a, a data set size of 60 terabytes, to be our validation cohort. So what will we do? We'll use the Seven Bridges Genomics Cancer Cloud, deploy a Docker-based germline genotyping pipeline to examine this, uh, a list of these uh, genes and basically look at whether we're able to validate our findings in the main cohort. How will we do this? Okay, well, First and foremost, this can take months sometimes, um, get approval for TCGA data. Uh, if you don't have this and you want to do TCGA analysis, I suggest you start early because this can really take some time. Uh, you need to apply for NCA Cloud Pilot credits or plug in your credit card, build a Docker image of the pipeline, upload it to the platform. You want to select the data of interest, you want to be able to configure your analysis, and then we'll be using the Seven Bridges Python API to programmatically schedule jobs, download BCF files, and profit, or actually carry on on your laptop sort of doing your downstream analysis. Okay, so getting TCGA data approval. Again, I won't get into the details of this. Uh, there's links, and I think are, are these presentations circulated after? So, so if you guys need it, that will be available for you. Um, in the end, uh, the Seven Bridges platform uses an ERA Commons account that is actually given to you as part of getting TCGA approval and then can be used in different environments. So if you have an ERA Commons and you have TCGA approval, you're good to go. Uh, NCI Cloud Pilot Credits. So actually applying for the credits is quite easy. You can basically request with, on, with one of these platforms. They'll give you $300. Start off, pretty much no questions asked. You can fill out additional forms and, and sort of a project proposal. You can get another $1,500. Uh, so depending on sort of what you want to do and what size of the data set is that you want to interrogate, uh, this can get you a fair bit of the way through your analysis. Um, seven Bridges or none of these environments earn profits on the cloud pilot. I mean, Seven Bridges is a for-profit organization, but this particular cloud pilot is not a for-profit effort. So basically all the money that you spend goes to finance AWS infrastructure that you're running your jobs on. Uh, so sort of back of the napkin calculation will tell me that uh, using this uh, T2X large instance with eight cores, $300 will fund 750 hours of computing. So it's not negligible. And then you get billed on an hourly basis, even if you... Uh, 
Um, okay, so building a Docker image of your pipeline. Um, promise to not get into the details of this. There's many guides out there. Uh, in general, the very simple process is to pull some base image from Docker Hub, run a container, install the software that you want, commit that image to create a new version, and then push it out to the platform. Now your tool is a Docker image running on um, seven bridges. Um, the next thing you want to do is actually pull in the data. So you create a project, they have a data browser that lets you basically explore the different data sets that they have. Uh, the two data sets that they have is Cancer Genome Atlas and uh, Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. The, the way to pull down the data that you need, there's basically different parameters that you can specify for each one of these different data descriptions. Uh, this actually shows sort of the full hierarchy of the objects that they support and, and kind of the number of different objects that they have of each kind. So you end up building a query that basically specifies the data set of interest for you. So for us, this is, this is kind of the basic selection criteria. So we want files that are BAM using whole exome sequencing, uh, using a particular uh, reference genome. I must tell you, TCGA has about 15 different references that they've used over, over the, the runtime of the project. So it can be a little bit of a nightmare to keep this straight. But these are all using basically GRCH37. And then we're interested in normal samples. So we're doing this in the context of a germline uh, mutation analysis. So we're only pulling in the normal. And so this gives us uh, 11,083 objects, which are all BAM files. And so you can basically get a list. And so you can use um, copy files to project, which creates some sort of logical connection between that data set and your project. And you can then select those files for additional analysis. Um, OK, so we want to build a workflow that actually accomplishes this. So you have a graphical interface that allows you to do this. Uh, the general flow is, is as follows. Uh, we want to run Freebase. Uh, Freebase is the germline genotyper that we're using. Uh, there's um, an input that we use, which is a list of genes of interest that we call targets here. There's a reference genome that you need to supply. There's an input BAM file. All of these feed into this Freebase app, app that I will tell you the details about a little bit later. So we do this on 13,000 samples. Of course, we don't want to come out with 13,000 VCL files in the end. We actually want to merge all of those into one. We use another application that is doing that for us. So all of the files need to come together to one machine uh, for merging. And then that gives us an output at the end. Um, there's ways to configure workflows and so on. So here. Um, and, and this will be a little bit telling about the type of experience that you get on, on this platform and, and many similar platforms. Um, there, there'll be a little link somewhere in the corner that you can click that will bring out a magic panel that you can type in magic commands into that will control in very powerful ways how your analysis goes and, and how much money you'll spend. So in this case, for instance, controlling the number of parallel instances that you will deploy on AWS is hiding behind such a link. I would never know if, if I wasn't told by someone. It's in the docs, but the docs will be, you know, a thousand pages that you need to read. So, so I think this is kind of, for now, the reality of how some of these, how, how these platforms operate. Nevertheless, you want to know about that specific thing because otherwise you may deploy a thousand AWS instances and get charged by the hour. Okay, so each workflow is composed of apps. So each step in the workflow that I showed you before is an app. There's, there's two of those steps, the genotyping and then the merging. Uh, so in general, the app uh, describes the, the, the algorithm that you want to be running. So this is the basic screen that you get. Uh, there's different configurations for things like inputs and outputs. Um, you know, you get a, a link to the Docker uh, image that you've uploaded and you have control over things like what is the actual command that you're going to be running and so on and so forth. Um, one important feature uh, is the ability to provide test values. So you're basically stringing together these applications that are moving files through different stages of processing. You can basically provide a set of dummy values that you can then use to test how does your command actually look at runtime. So you provide these in a, in a, into an input form, and then as you transform your data, you basically get sort of a real-time view without launching uh, any, any AWS instances on at least the, the grammatical form of your command, which I found quite helpful. Uh, 
So you want to connect your applications to data. You do that by specifying inputs. Uh, so here's an example of a few inputs. Uh, there is, we want to feed in for genotyping, we want to feed in a BAM file that has the genomic reads. Um, so this is an array because we're doing this on, on, on many different files and, and there's different, um, different parameters, there's different uh, data types that you can feed in, um, things like strings and files and so on and so forth. We're feeding in a reference, as I mentioned before, and we're feeding in the list of genes of interest. Um, it has some neat little features, like for instance saying, well, if I'm pulling in a BAM file, there's also some secondary files that are related, things like BAM index files, for instance. So you can get fairly uh, easy, there's a fairly easy way for you to include that. You basically just say include and, and, and you provide sort of a, a, a regular expression that lets you match what is a, the accompanying set of files so that you don't have to name you know, every of, of a thousand different files that you have. And also one of the key sort of components is, well, that's some pretty pretty big uh, samples that you're going to be analyzing. So if you are going to be copying all of those onto some hard drive, onto some instance, you'll be sitting there for hours moving data around. And so they have ways for you to basically both copy if you so, if, to copy if you so require or to link. And they also have uh, sort of a, an experimental stream-based implementation, which again is hiding behind some magic line that pops out of nowhere. But if you know the magic place, then you can take advantage of um, their beta streaming implementation. Um, output looks very similar. You basically specify what you want your output file to be. Um, one of the capabilities that they actually provide for you is, well, you have files with different names, so you actually want to be able to use um, a scripting language to define programmatically things like what will be the, out, the, the name of the output file based on the input files that you've created. I mean, if you remember back to sort of the goals, we want to run this on 13,000 BAM files. Each one of them has some name that needs to translate into the output, that, that needs to be collected and merged and so on and so forth. So, out from another magic place pops out a, a JavaScript console, which you can type into your scripts. Uh, you can try those scripts based on the test data like I talked to you about. So you can put in some test file names to see you know, if you're covering your, your corner cases right. But this basically lets you take the so job as kind of the big context object that you have to interrogate what is actually going on at runtime. You can then resolve that to the inputs that you fed in. The, the BAM file, so this is the name of one of the inputs that I showed you before, and then do some text munging to basically spit out the, the first part of the name, and then you can attach something like outbcf to it to name your output file. So the next thing, if you remember, after we actually do the genotyping, we want to do merging. Uh, so how does merging work? I mean, if you'd imagine we had multiple instances running, each one of them processed a BAM file, we now need to assemble 13,000 uh, VCF files onto one, onto one host and then do the merging. Well, it's a little bit sort of, well, it's a little bit hacky, but this is how they suggested we do this. Um, we basically need to compile, well, first of all, you need to do things like indexing the files and, and zipping them and so on and so forth, but then you, you need to compile a sample list that you can then feed into a tool like BCF Tools. And so we're using the same kind of utilities of the JavaScript engine uh, and, and the command that, that they provide you to basically string together a number of invocations that first compile the sample list and then invoke BCF Tools. So this is basically us uh, again, using a list of 13,000 file names to generate the bgzip and tabix commands that will do um, the, the indexing, running those. This is kind of an example of, of what that file might look like using test values, and then doing the same for li basically listing a set of BCF files that will be then used for merging. Well, okay, how, we've defined all of these things, the workflow is there, how do we actually run it? So. It turns out that using a graphical user interface to manipulate 13,000 files doesn't always work really well, which both I discovered and they discovered when I discovered it. So the best way to do this really is using the API. So this is where you know your Python skills uh, come to the fore. So they have a pretty pretty nice Python API that you can use to do this programmatically and basically bypass. Uh, most of the graphical user interface, which I think the more you run real analysis, the more you tend to start relying on as much as possible to do your actual coding. 
But I'll walk you very, very quickly in the interest of time through sort of how that comes together. So we basically import their, their, um, their API module, um, initialize an object that we use to interact with it. We want to be able to, uh, here on lines 2 through 14, we want to be able to find the actual project in the context of which we're doing uh, this work. There are some parameters that we're going to be supplying to this at runtime, like what is the actual list of references. So we want to build a set of input files. If you remember, I selected from all of the data a subset that I brought into my project. Now I need to create actual tasks that will do the work based on sort of further selection criteria. So I do this by building a query here. So this api.files.query call. Um, interrogating the metadata for those files. So I'm, I'm supplying things like what the reference genome is, what the data format is, and so on and so forth. And so this allows me to basically build a Python dictionary that has a list of all the different samples that I want to analyze. Uh, using all of those, I'm doing some back of the napkin calculations on, if you remember, you're paying by the hour, you can only do a certain amount of computation on, on any given host. And so you need to do some calculations about how you actually optimize your resources. So uh, uh, part of the script basically just says, well, this is how many samples I want to do. This is the number of cores that I'm using, so on and so forth. I, you know, This is kind of an optimal configuration that I can use to make the best usage of, of the money that I have. And so we're basically calculating how many tasks to stuff in to any given host so that we're where our job will take us close to an hour, so we can actually take full advantage of the by the hour building. Okay, well, after we've built all this up and we've partitioned the data into these tasks, we can basically run through those and then start creating these task instances, not really kicking them off. I mean, I'm not really a big fan of saying, I'm going to have a script that will now launch hundreds of VMs that will go and do stuff for me. I mean, very slight bugs can cause you to lose a lot of money doing that. So what this is really doing is it's creating task instances that you can then go off and, and run yourself, which I think is sort of the preferable and safe way. So once you've done that, you get a list like that. You can go on, you can kick these off. This is basically sort of the details of what one, one task looks like. So one task pulls in about 1900 BAM files onto a single host, does the genotyping and, and basically spits those out. Okay, okay, kick it off. Once you kick it off, you get some, some monitoring capabilities where you can see. So each one of these is, is, is an individual job that is being run on your hosts. You can basically kind of see how they're faring, how they're assigned to different hosts and so on and so forth. And then this is a view of the actual fleet that you have. So I'm running this on 10 instances. It took 15 minutes to run. If I want to dig into what's actually going on in those hosts, I can click on something like view logs. This gives me an output per each host of what is actually going on at runtime. Of course, this is more useful when things fail and you're trying to diagnose. Well, if, you're, if, if everything runs fine, then you get rewarded with a nice green complete, completed uh, status. You get the price that you actually pay and you can download the output file. Uh, for this analysis that went over 60 terabytes of data, the full analysis cost was $100. And this is including all of the failed runs and all of sort of our uh, you know, our process of actually having developed these pipelines and so on and so forth. So one actual run through the data set ended up costing something like $40 in the end, like the last successful run that produced the output that we used. So I think it can be used to do real, real analyses. I mean, if you do this on whole genomes, you can't get very far with 300 bucks, but on whole exomes, you can do quite substantial. And then once you have your outputs, well, this is the time that you don't actually need cloud computing anymore. You have a VCF file, fits on your laptop, download it, and basically go nuts. So we can start you know, going off and characterizing the different mutations that we find. We can start looking at what are the loss of function mutations and, and the sort of different mutation impacts using something like variant effect predictor and sort of go on, go on with our life post, you know, post this cloud deployment. Okay, so that's the overall story. So what were the key lessons learned? Okay, well, unlike infrastructure as a service where things are relatively um, um, relatively the same between different cloud providers with some different formats, well, each platform and software as a service is very, very different. And so each one has its own learning curve. So if you decide to go on and, and, and do real analysis on those, it's real investment that you have to make and that you know you won't be able to carry anywhere else. So that's like a real cost, basically. 
Uh, support for Docker CWL allows the easy ingestion of your custom pipeline. So this was this is something that worked really well in this context. Basically, within like an hour, we're able to take our pipeline, integrate into some Docker containers, ship it off, and it's it's basically running on there. The user interface can be quite sluggish and buggy when dealing with large number of files. Um, and operating on these large data sets sort of often breaks these pilot platforms. So they're typically built you know, with, with also pilot use cases in mind. And when what you want to do is run your analysis on the whole of TCGA, start discovering a few icebergs. So I think you should build into that your, into your plan for when you do. Ability to use the API directly certainly allows us to work around above issues and, and has a few other benefits. Um, Obscured and undocumented features can block or enable progress. So I talked to you guys about the, the magic different settings that you have. Um, there were a few parts of this analysis where I would have never known or found the solution if I didn't have somebody to talk to. And that will be kind of my last point is ability to get live support and debugging helps really a lot. So with, uh, with these particular guys, I actually had the benefit of having somebody from their team responsive and answering my queries and trying to figure things out. But the overall experience has been, you can work for a week trying to get something done and be blocked and you will never know the answer because it's not anywhere to be found. But they'll be like, oh, well, just click on these three dots in the corner and it pops out the panel and just type in that setting and, and you're good to go. So, you know, that's kind of a, a word of warning. The last thing to say is that not having direct access to the underlying VMs definitely complicates your debugging efforts. So this is what you give up by signing up to one of these platforms. You're no longer controlling your virtual machines. You can't really peer into those. You can really only use the outputs that they provide for you. And so this can really make you feel like you don't have the same amount of power that you might on an infrastructure as a service kind of offering. So that's the end of my story. Uh, many acknowledgements to make, both in EMBL, EMBL EBI, Seven Bridges, as well as funding from uh, uh, European Commission. And yeah, thanks.